Let's talk about ellipses next. Let's start with the definition. An ellipse is a set of all points in a plane equidistant from two fixed points called the foci. And so if I were to sketch the picture of an ellipse, here we go. Uh, that's pretty poor. Let me try one more time. Better. Uh, we would have two points in here, and these would be called the foci, plural of focus, and you may also see that pronounced foci, foci or foci, and these two points uh, are what drive this ellipse, or they're what create it. So almost think about, you know, taking two pegs and sticking them in a uh, pegboard, and then loosely tie a string ar around that peg. So if I were to push my, my pencil to the edge of that string, it's only going to allow me to ever travel so far away from that, those two central pegs. Uh, and that's this idea. It's, we're always staying the same distance away. So if I were to look at this point right here, this distance plus this distance would be equal to, if I took this point right here, this distance plus this larger distance. So I'm not saying I had the, the focal points exactly right, but it's this idea that, hey, I'm starting with these two central pegs, loosely tie that piece of string around it, and then push to the edge of that string, and that's going to allow us to create that, that ellipse. That is what's going on. Let's talk about some of the key characteristics that this ellipse has. Let me draw a new ellipse. We've already talked about the focal points or the foci, foci, call it F1, F2. Now in the very center is a point called the center. That's in the very middle. Uh, and then these points over here, the sharper turns, call those the vertices. Now some books will label uh, kind of a major vertex and a, a minor vertex. These points right here, I don't call those the vertices. Uh, they don't really, they are providing a change in direction, but I, I label the, the points along my uh, longer direction, my vertices. Now this longer direction has a name. This blue line right here is what is called the major axis. And the major axis is a line segment Uh, connect, um, connecting the vertices passing through the center and obviously it has to pass through the uh, foci as well. Then we also have this line right here and this is called the minor axis. The minor axis is also a line segment uh, connecting, uh, let me say, perpendicular to the major axis with endpoints on the ellipse that passes through center. And that's why you'll sometimes hear these called the minor vertices, um, because they do lie on that minor axis versus our major vertices. But again, I'm just going to refer to the vertices as uh, the sharper bends, not on the minor, the minor side. All right. Lost my definition. So with that in mind, now we want to see how to find all of these elements. All right, so let's move on and look at the standard form of an ellipse. Now, the thing I'm going to point out is there's going to be a lot of similarities between this and what we're doing for the parabolas. And there's also actually a lot of similarities between the standard form of an ellipse and the standard form of a circle. And like I talked about in that introductory video, they're all related through the idea they're all sections of cones. They're all just slices of cones. And so we have two different formats, again, the same way we did with parabolas, because it could be oriented in two different ways. It could be oriented so that it is wider, or it could be oriented so that it is taller. And the way we tell which one is which, notice I have the, the terms leading off a little different. I have the x's leading off versus the y's. And that's not to say we can always reorder anything, right? It doesn't matter if we have an x squared plus x plus 3 or a 3 plus x plus x squared, we can always reorder terms. The key is what's in the denominator. 
So whatever's in the denominator is telling us which way it's going to be oriented. The larger element is always going to drive that to be the longer side. So if the larger element is under the x, it's going to be longer on the x-axis, it's going to be longer, wider. If the a, the larger value is under the y, it's going to be longer along the vertical axis or taller. Uh, and so that's how we can tell whether it's going to be tall or long. But again, similar to the, the problem that we have these two different equations. Another big similarity is the h and the k. Now with a parabola, we called it the vertex. So there's no center to a parabola because it goes on infinitely. But if we think about what that center point of the, the vertex is, it's kind of equivalent to the, the vertex. Uh, here we do call it the center because we do have a center that is different than the vertex. And that's true in both cases. The center is going to be the point hk. To compare it to another conic section that you already know, a circle. Remember, circles had the form x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. Again, the center was this point hk. Now, a little different because we had this r squared, and the reason for that, with ellipses, they're longer or they're taller, and that's driven by the difference in the a and the b. The a and the b are going to tell me how to count from that center point left, right, up, down. With the circle, we didn't have to distinguish two different. We didn't have a denominator because it was they were the same. The, the denominator would be the same, so we just set it equal to that, that number. We called that the radius uh, because all elements were the same. We always were the same amount away from the center. So that's the difference between an ellipse and a circle. But that a and that b are very important numbers. The a gives me the distance left, right, up, and down, depending on which one they're under. So notice here the a is under the x. The a is going to be the, different, the distance to the, the vertices, left and right, versus on this one, the a is still the distance to the vertex, but now it's counting up and down. The b is under the x, so that's going to be how much it is left and right. So those a and b numbers are very intuitive with the ellipse. They tell me literally how much to count from the center to get to the edge of the circle. And they are attached to the uh, variable or the axis we need to count along. So the a's are attached to the x's versus the a's are attached to the y's. And so the vertices, remember I just distinguished the major axis vertices. Uh, if it's opening, or if it's, I should say, wider, the a is counting left and right. So we would add, subtract that a to the h. And then for the uh, ellipse that is up and down, we would have to add, subtract that to the k. Notice in both cases we're adding the a's though because the a is always a larger number. Also notice one other thing about the equation, kind of like when we pull the centers out as the opposite hk, we have to change the signs. Here the a and the b are squared in the equation, but when we pull them out, we're just using the a and b, not whatever the squared is. So we'll see examples of this, but for instance, if we had a 16 in the denominator, we would use a four here. Uh, next thing that we want to be able to find are the foci or the foci, the focal points. And that's going to require another calculation. It's going to require a value called the c. And the way we find c is a squared minus b squared. And so there's another c, a, b, c squared equation we're very comfortable with, which is the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Notice that is not what we have said here. c squared equals a squared minus b squared. And the reason for that, that c is occurring inside of the ellipse. I've made my triangles really, oh, my uh, ellipse is really messy here. But these kind of darker x's here, these would be my focal points. They're inside the ellipse, and so we're gonna we can't go larger than the a and the b. It's gonna have to occur inside. It is looking a lot like the Pythagorean theorem. I'm not gonna get into how to derive that the the c in this video. It's looking a lot like it because it does rely on the Pythagorean theorem. It's just that c is actually one of the sides that's not the hypotenuse. So a is the longest side, that is your hypotenuse. And so we've kind of reversed engineered this to find, find the C. What's gonna make this even more confusing too, I'll, I'll go and warn you, hyperbolas, we're also gonna rely on the C for the focus. Uh, it's gonna be a very similar equation, but for the hyperbola it is actually gonna be the plus. So I'll talk more about this in that video, but we do need to make sure we're getting the C's right. Uh, the c is always going to have to occur inside the hyperbola. If you get a larger c value to where your c is occurring outside, clearly you've done something wrong. Go back and check your sign. Uh, you're using the opposite sign from the equation itself. And so to get to the focus, right, we're still starting at the center. And we're counting by that c amount 
left and right to get to the focus from the uh, center. So I'm going to start at my point H. I'm going to add, subtract the C. K is going to remain unchanged. If it's opening up and down, that C is still getting me up and down to the focus, but this time we're changing the K coordinate. Uh, finally, the major axis length we can define as 2a, the minor axis length, axis length is 2b, and notice I've written that across both of them, that's not going to change because a we've always said is a larger number, so that's going to be the longer axis. So let's take an example where we find all the different elements. Let's take uh, y minus 1 squared over 9 plus x plus 3 squared over uh, 4 equals 1. So this one's been given to us nicely in the uh, standard form. So I'm just going to start picking out my information. Now the first thing I'm going to do, same as I did with my parabolas, is I'm going to sketch my picture just to get a frame of reference of which way it's going. You can see the larger denominator occurs under the y. does mean it needs to be taller. So the vertex is going to be the point negative 3, 1. Next, I need to pick out my a and my b, and we can use those to get my c. The a is going to be the square root of the 9, which will be 3. The b will be the square root of 4, which is 2. And so I can use these to get to... I mislabeled that, that should be my center, not my vertex, center. The center is the point negative 3, 1. Now we're looking for the vertices. The vertices, from the center point, I need to go up and down to get to the vertices. So I'm going to take that a amount and add it and subtract it to the y coordinate, up and down. So the negative 3 will stay the same. If we're going to go up, we'd have 1 plus 3, which is 4. We're going to go down, we'd have 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. It does not matter which of those two you list first. So we have our center, we have our vertices. Next, I'd like to find my foci, but I need the c value. So c squared is equal to a squared, which is 9, minus b squared, which is 4. It's just those initial values, what they were before they are squared, or you can take them here and square them again. So c squared is equal to 5. That means c is going to be equal to the square root of 5 which is not a, a nice pretty number. We know it's between 2 and 3. It's going to be a lot closer to 2. So we can kind of ballpark that, and we can even type that into the calculator. And uh, that would give us the exact, not an exact, but a better approximation. If we were to type in the square root of 5, we'd have 2.2361, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we know approximately how far it is. But when I'm writing down those focal points, I'm going to use that exact value. I started at my center. If I go up to get to my focal point, I have to add square root of 5. If I go down, I'm going to subtract 1 minus the square root of 5. The length of the major axis would be equal to 2 times my a, which is 6, and the length of the minor is equal to 4. Now let me do the picture. And actually, on the ellipses, I said let me sketch it at the start, but I could have done the perfect sketch right from the the beginning. I could have done the exact picture because ellipses are so visually obvious from their equation. I know that I had to go back three up one to get to my center. That was my center point. It's telling me that to get to the edges of my ellipse I have to go up and down by three. So that would be the top and the bottom of my ellipse. To get to the sides I have to go left and right by two. So connecting my points, that would be my, my picture. I knew exactly what it was without any of this extra information. Now I've also defined them. I know exactly where that vertex occurs. I know exactly where that vertex occurs. I'm also going to check my, fo my focal points, my foci, to make sure that I have them right. Because remember I said if we make that mistake of adding the A and the B instead of subtracting, we're going to end up with a focal point outside of the, the ellipse. Let's see if that happened. 1 plus the square root of 5, which is uh, approximately 3.24, 1, 2, 3.24, be right about in here. This would be one of our focal points. The other one would be uh, the 1 minus the square root of 5, so approximately negative 
two, four. That'd be somewhere right in here. Notice they are inside the ellipse, so we do know that they, that those are drawn correctly. That looks good. Let's take another example. Let's say we have four x minus uh, one squared plus y plus three squared equals one. Well, promising start. We have the perfect squares already done for us. It is set equal to one, but we don't have the things over. We don't have the squares over other numbers, and so we really need to have that that a and the b underneath, so we know that how much to count left, right, up, down, so forth. Now I can't divide by four because I don't want this one to change. I can't change that one to a one fourth. I need that to be a one on that side. But what I can do is I can move this to the denominator of the fraction by dividing by the reciprocal. This is kind of opposite of what we would normally do with fractions. Normally with fractions, we say we want to simplify. And so we take this, we multiply by the reciprocal. I'm doing the exact opposite. I'm saying rather than multiplying, I'm going to take this, I'm going to divide by the reciprocal so I can get that a and b into the denominator. So this x now is over its a or b term. We're not sure which one it is yet. The y, however, there's nothing sitting down there. But remember, there's always something sitting down there. There's no coefficient on the y, so it's understood over a 1. We think about what's bigger, the one-fourth or the one. Well, obviously the one's bigger. So if we're going to write this in true standard form, we would write it like this. I do recommend with ellipses, this is one time in, in math and also hyperbolas, I will allow you to leave denominators in your fractions because this makes it much more easy to see what the a and the b are. Uh, you do not need to write it over one. I don't care to see that. If you're writing this in standard form, I can understand it's over one. If it helps, write it there. I don't care that you reverse the position of these two things. You could have left it like this. Again, understand uh, that you can understand that one is bigger than one fourth. However, if it helps you, do it. Take that extra second, rewrite it rather than make a mistake. So as we said in the last example, I can go ahead and get the perfect picture. I know exactly what this is gonna look like. My center is gonna be one, negative three. One, one, two, three. I know because the y is larger, it's going to be taller over wider. My a, square root of 1, is 1. So that tells me to go up and down by 1 to get to the top and the bottom of this ellipse. My b, the square root of 1 fourth, is 1 half. So that tells me to go a half of a unit left and right to get to the edges of my ellipse. So very small units, but we can see that it is just a little bit taller than it is uh, wide, and I exaggerated a little bit there. Um, but one and one half are relatively close. It's going to be relatively circular, but not quite perfect, right? If I want the vertices, I'm going to leave my x coordinate line. I have to add the a value to my y, so I'd have negative 2, and then I have to subtract, and I'd get negative 4. If I want my focal points, I need my c. So c squared would be equal to 1 minus 1 fourth. So c is going to be equal to the square root of 3 fourths. So our focal point, we'd have 1 and negative 3 plus square root of 3 fourths. 1, negative 3 minus square root of 3 fourths. Uh, the length of the major axis would be double the a, which is 2. The length of the minor. would be double one half would be one so this is a unit across two units in height if we double check those focal points i'm starting at negative three i'm adding the square root of three fourths um, so less than one and that's what we're going to see it's going to be very close to those ones but it's going to be inside of that ellipse so those all look good let's take a, another equation let's take two x squared plus uh, 4y squared minus 8x plus 4y minus 16 equals 0. Now, if I look at this, it's not in the correct form. It's non standard form. So I need to start by writing this thing in terms of standard form. Uh, one of the first things I recognize is that. I need to get those perfect squares together. 
So I'm going to start by rearranging. I'm going to get my x terms together. I'm going to get my y terms together. Everything that wasn't an x or y, I'm going to move to the other side. That's the same as we did with the parabolas. Now here's the difference, though. With uh, When we're completing the square, we need the coefficients on the x squared and on the y squared to be perfect once. With a parabola or with a circle, very easily we could have just divided everything by that coefficient to get rid of it. So for instance, I could divide everything by 2, and that would be a perfect x squared. But the problem is, I would also need to divide by the 4. If I were to divide 2 by 4, I would have 1 half. I would have changed my coefficient from being uh, the 1 again. So we can't divide everything by the same number to get our coefficients on the x squared and y squared to be uh, 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor those coefficients off. So I'll have 2 times x squared minus 4x plus, I'll leave myself a blank. Then because the y's are completely different, I'm treating them completely separately, I'm going to do their own little completing square problem over here. So I'm going to factor the 4 off. I have y squared plus y plus, I'm going to leave myself the blank. Over here, the 16 is now going to be added uh, by two things. I'm going to have two things I have to add to that. So I'm using the x's. I'm, I'm completing the score on those. I'm completing the score on the y's, setting up two different problems, and then we'll have to add both things over here. So from here, I'm going to do the same completing the square I'm used to. I'm going to say, well, what is half of negative 4? It's negative 2. I have to square that. And negative 2 squared is 4. So I might think for half a second, I'm going to put a 4 over here, but I'm not, because this isn't 4. This is 4 times 2. Remember, we factored that 2 off just a second ago. We have to remember that that 2 is still involved. So 4 times 2 is 8. Same idea here. I'm going to take half of the uh, 1, which is 1 half. I'm going to square it. Well, I know half of 1 half, uh, I know 1 half squared is 1 fourth, but it's also being multiplied by the 4, so I have to remember to put that 1 there. And so now we have all of this correct. My perfect square will be x minus 2 squared. My perfect square will be y plus 1 half squared. And if I add these things together, 16 and 8 is 24. Add one more is 25. And then last, I need to have a 1 over here. So I'm going to divide everything by that 25. And now I have it equal to 1. I still have the problem that it's not purely x squared over a number, y squared over a number. It is uh, a coefficient on those. So the same trick I used in that last example, I'm going to move these back down to the denominator by dividing by the reciprocal. And so we'd have 25 halves and 25 fourths. So Kind of ugly numbers again, but it's fine. We, we take what we're given, and we're going to figure out what this thing looks like. We'll figure out all of its center vertices, all that sort of thing. So the center, very easy, 2, negative 1 half, relatively clean numbers there, negative 1 half. Uh, that's going to be our center. For our vertices, we need to decide which of these two numbers is larger, and that is the 25 halves. Obviously, dividing 25 by a smaller number is going to be bigger than 25 divided by the 4. So the a is going to be equal to the square root of 25 halves. The b would be equal to the square root of 25 fourths. Now the first one cleans up very nicely. Sorry, the, the first one does not clean up very nicely. Uh, 5 over the square root of 2 versus the second one cleans up very nicely. It'd be 5 halves. Um, if we wanted to rationalize the a, we could. I don't really care that you rationalize uh, for, for my work. If, if a problem is asking for it, make sure that you do but I'm just going to leave it as uh, 5 square root of 2, 5 over the square root of 2. So if we were to approximate that, that would be approximately 3 and 3.54. Uh, again, we see it's a little bit bigger than the 2.5 there. Uh, but that will be more useful when it comes time to graphing because we could say, hey, we need to go up and down. Sorry, we need to go left and right. That's attached to the x by 3.5 units approximately. 1, 2, 3 and a half. That'll be one of our vertices. Then I need to go back one, two, three, and a half. Not perfectly, but approximately. So those will be the edges. And then to get to the top and bottom, we'd have to go up and down by two and a half. So half, one, two, and then half, one, two. And so that would be our uh, ellipse. That's a rough job because I uh, 
don't have graph paper and um, the numbers are a little messier there. We don't have that whole number. So our vertices, we took two and we added the five over root two. We left the y the same. And we also took the two, we subtracted the five over the root two. The first I, I still need to figure those out, so I need to figure out my C. My C squared would be equal to my A minus my B. So I need a common denominator, which will be the fourths, 50 fourths minus 25 fourths. And that will give me 25 fourths. So our C will also be equal to 5 over 2, happens to be the same as the B. And so to get to our focal points, we add 5 over 2. And we subtract the 5 over 2. We can simplify this now, unlike what we had done with the vertices just a second ago. We can't simplify something with the radicals unless we're going to approximate. Uh, but here we would have uh, 9 halves, negative 1 half, and uh, that one would be negative 1 half, negative 1 half. And so if we were to look where those occur, 4 and a half would be inside of our uh, parabola our focal point would be inside and then negative one half would also be inside so both of those look good. The major axis would have a length of 10 over root 2 just doubling that and then the minor axis would be a length of 5. And so now we have all the key components. A little bit messier because we had those radicals and those messy fractions but it's the same idea. Last thing I want to do is just a quick find the equation of the conic section. Given uh, vertices of 1, 2, 5, 2, and a minor axis of length 1. Now, with uh, the parabolas, there's relatively little information that could be given. There is the vertex, there was the directrix, there was the focal point. There could be just points along the curve as well. With uh, our ellipses, there can be a lot more given. Now, how do I know this is actually an ellipse? Because it says a conic section. This says minor axis. The only conic section that has a minor axis is the ellipse. I know we haven't talked about hyperbolas yet, but uh, major minor axes are unique to the ellipse. The other thing unique to ellipses is they have two vertices, two focal points, and the foci are always contained inside the shape. Circles don't have fo foci. It's the same as the center. They don't have uh, vertices. Every point is the same amount of bend. Uh, hyperbolas, the focal points are outside of the vertices. So those are kind of some of the key characteristics. Characteristics. We'll talk more about hyperbolas in the next video. So I know that this is a uh, an ellipse. That's the first thing to realize. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch a picture because we've done that time and time again. So my vertices, 1, 2, and 5, 2. So that tells me it has to be opening left and right. I also know that this distance across is equal to a 1. And so because it's longer left and right, I know it has to have the form x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. I want to find out where that vertex is next. Well, I know it has to be halfway in between the vertices. So the vertex, the uh, center, the center keeps saying vertex, but the center has to be halfway between the vertices. The center is going to have to have a y coordinate of 2. And if we think about the x's, what's halfway between 1 and 5? Well, we can add the two numbers and divide by 2, simply take the midpoint, and 1 plus 5 is 6, divided by 2 is 3. So the center has to be at the point 3, 2. So that helps me fill in the h and the k. But I also need to know the a and the b. Well, the A stems from how far we have to travel from the center to get to one of those vertices. We just found that center was at 3. 
we have to travel two units to get to five, or we have to travel two units to get to the one. So the a, little a, has to be equal to two. The b is how far we have to travel from the center to top and bottom. And we're told the minor axis has a length of one, so that means to get halfway up, we're going a, a length of one half, meaning our b is equal to one half. Now I'm going to put those in the appropriate spots, remembering to square. So our a was 2. When I square that, I get a 4. The b, the up and down, uh, that was 1 half. When I square it, I get 1 fourth. And this is where I said I don't care that you actually simplify fractions. So you can leave that just like that. If you want to move the 4 up to the numerator, you, you can, but it's actually really no longer in the standard position. So really it's preferable not to move the 1 fourth if we want to have that, that ellipse in the standard position. We want to have it over at say a and b. So again, just like with the parabola, we defined a lot of equations at the start. We never looked at those again. We just understood what the a, the b did, and then of course little c to find the focal points of the foci. Uh, we just relied on our knowledge of what each letter, each element represented, and we drew the picture, we sketched a graph, and we were able to find information from an equation, or we were able to find the equation given some information.